<laughs> right, everybody got the screen on, main screen, yes? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, Vic. we've got uh, 256 slides to get through tonight. Huh? So I'm going to wish through them. If you miss anything, it's be on uh, YouTube. <coughs> Let's see how we get going. Right, nice bit of sun the last couple of days. Mm. So uh, enjoy it while we can. We've still got it for a while anyway. Hope so. That ain't working. So let's try that one. That's better. Mm. Right, mostly seedlings when they get to that stage, then they'll be having a wire over them because he's just starting to bend over. There's my wires which I covered last week. Little ones and big chaps. <coughs> now we're doing each one's. My compost in the warm end of the greenhouse is in the on top of me where a uh, bucket of water so that's a uh, greenhouse temperature mm -hmm. and not a uh, the cold end as we can see there <coughs> right this is rosie having a, a bath to bribe mm. her we have to give her a lick mat there's a uh, on the end of the mat which works the wall is licking all the whatever we feed it i think that was a weeder mix but it does keep her quiet that stores that out. <laughs> right, this is down our allotments. This was uh, during the week. Now, this is the ground I borrowed off the council a few years back. I'm doing a piece on this uh, next week. But uh, I borrowed this ground off the council, and beyond that was all derelict. And they started strimming it uh, last week, Brilliant. which we started, um, and that's what they've done. I've strimmed it down. Now, the, the builders have been after this land for quite a while, uh, obviously to build on, so we were panicking for a bit, but we found out it is for, um, uh, for recreation purposes, so uh, we've got to keep an eye on that lot. Right, during the week, I've been uh, weighing out my mycorrhizal fungi again. There's a, there's a few people asked for that, so I've sent that out by post. Somebody's asked me a question on Perlka. I couldn't get it in this week. So I'll cover that next week, explaining what it is. Yeah. Obviously, it's iron nitrogen I've got feed, some of that. but uh, it's, it's good stuff. But I'll, I'll cover that next week. I just ain't got enough room this week to cover it. And a little bit on composting as we are there. Right. Bougainvillea. These are the little traps. Them two in the front. Now, I've overwintered these, um, obviously, to look after them. Bring him in out of the frost. Good job he did. Because we've had some bloody good frost. People don't uh, know what they are. It's, it's these flowers you get in Spain. But they're, they're a busting colour when they come out. It's a lovely flower. <coughs> and there's the one I bought indoors. I bought this standard down I was in last year. Uh, I think it's 14 quid in full bloom. It was beautiful. And that uh, flowered all through the, um, the summer. And... Uh, I put him in the cold end of the greenhouse and then in the warm end because I knew he was going to get some bad frost. And he, he started growing again. I thought, well, it's really common sense, isn't it? So I bought him in the kitchen and he flowered a bit and he's, he's now ticking over nicely. But it just shows you a bit of warmth. That's why you have a greenhouse heating or whatever. So uh, I'm upending that, those two that are hadn't spurred in. And what I'm going to do is, um, you can see the, the new white roots underneath, mm. they've got little high feet yeah. airs on them. Mm. So they're telling me they want to get looked after. So I'm taking all the old rubbish off and I'm going to repot them in a nice brew of uh, fresh compost in the bottom. So I fill the bottom of the pot, I'm going to stick some mycorrhizal or fungi under his aris. Give him a helping hand. So put them in the pot upright. Then I'm going to firm the compost down. It goes on, get my fingers down, then I use the side of a spoon to get the compost right the way down the bottom of the pot. Mm. I'll then give him a nice weight in, a good one, so it does come out the bottom. And then I will do the next one. He's starting up again as well. So doing the, exactly the same again, holding them upright. And there we are, and we'll see how them poo later on. Right, that was my first tear drop put in. He's doing well. Let's have a nose underneath. If you want to 
put anything on, always water two days before, because if it is dry and you're upended, then everything usually collapses. But as you see, he's, he's hanging on to himself there, and there ain't that many roots on. So I water them a couple of days before, before you're upending. Right, this photo was sent in by my mate Roger from he's in Gloucestershire and that was his almond tree. Oh. He, he's too early. He said he's bloody miles too early. But that's our loopy weather. We don't know what's happening. Bloody nature don't know what's happening, does it? <laughs> right. Alstromeria. I love these. Growing these on for me for, for the mate. Starting them up for it. That's what they look like if uh, Nobody's got an idea. Beautiful flower. I had these uh, about 10 years ago and I fell in love with these. They flower all summer until the first frost and the, the colours are corkers. So uh, I'm looking after them as well. Uh, go back on there. When these start getting big, like see them two in the middle on, on the tray on the left. Don't forget, this is the warm end of the greenhouse. But when they get that size there, I'm going to transfer them and have it I've gone here to the cold end of the greenhouse. I don't want them to get too far on forward. Right, these are Carolina Reaper chili peppers. And we're coming on slowly. This was a week yesterday down the trading sheds. When I put the cones, I always lift the cones and unlick all the worms from underneath. Because it's nice and moist under there. And then I put them in my compost. <laughs> Next day. Right, now this is... My mate sent this. is uh, Paul Nelson from King Swinford. He sent me this in. I'm hoping it's working. Because it is a video. Bear with me. Don't last long, so uh, don't blink. <laughs> Look at that. Oh. Mm. Anybody get excited? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see it again? No. <laughs> oh, crap. Oh. Right, um, <clears throat> last week we had the old um, prize giving. We spun the wheel and Paul Westwood. Fix. So I did fix. some manure during the week. Fix. And, uh, <laughs> it wasn't all. He won his mammoth pee. He's drunk half of that already. There <laughs> it is on his mantelpiece. Pride of honour. <laughs> Sue Moss got the next one. And the one out of Ben's drawing. And there he is on the mantelpiece as well. <laughs> Right, next week's prize, which I've managed to get, is a 10 kilo bag of reaming volcanic rockers. Wow. You ain't got to put that on your mantelpiece. Oh, oh, <laughs> Just took a photo of it, but money's over. So we got that for, uh, for next week. I'll do the draw later on. So, uh, I'm in, and luckily, yeah, it's not... oh, I did donated. see it before. And the oh, other prize is two bags of microbial yeah, 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 yeah. bottle of liquid tea and two bags of charge, which you oh, eat nice. again, or frass if you're posh. That micro goes for me. Oh. Oh, if you remember, uh, yes. two weeks ago there was a couple cavorting in the background. Can you remember them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then it's the speaker. Up. Anybody remember it? Yeah. yeah. Well, last yeah. week I asked for a photo as they would have been listening last week. You could do it two weeks on the trot. And uh, this is the photo they sent. He said, This is the missus who was on top and I burned her ass on the, on the ceiling, like fusing everything. But at least I sent a photo in. <laughs> <laughs> right, I also mentioned these last week. Now, I've been in touch again. And there's quite a uh, beaver. Uh, that's why you got a bung in. If you're at a topsoil, multi purpose compost, anything like this, buy the ton bag. Then these are the cheapest ones out. And that's what they do. But the thing with these, I've found out they do uh, under a thousand litre bags and a 1400 litre bags. 
what they've done now, as you can see, there's a thousand litre bag, £80.50. Now, this is cheap. That's good. They've already got a discount on them. And there we have the 1400 litre. Now, it's only gone up to 99 quid. Now, if you remember from a, I mean, a 1400 litre, that's nearly half the amount again. To the small amount. Now, if, if you go back on the, if you're interested on anything, I've been through all of them, and it is a chance. That's that's his number, which I've got. No, you what you got to do is ask for Dan, quote the compost king, and you get another five quid knocked off. Side so was knocked up already. Mm -hmm. So you can get a fourteen hundred liter bag for ninety four quid. If you've got to split that between three of it or more, and there's three of them at, at one ton bag themselves. So, what's we get into? This photo was put on uh, last uh, Monday or Tuesday, I think I've been put it on, asking people what year was this taken. And it was about 86, 87, 35 then. I love that sideboard, making sure got it. That was yeah. important to me winning. Years the, years ago. Collier Garnet Club. Yeah. Right, Lynn. Lynn, are you there? Yeah. Boss, Lynn, you can take over. All right. Our first uh, speak, not speak. Well, he's a speaker, isn't you, Lynn? Oh. Yeah, I'll try and do my best. Lynn's input. Excellent. I didn't realise you've got the front of the garden as well. So that's the front of my garden, which I did last year. Um, and it's a, a rock reef for dry area with Mediterranean plants that like a little bit of uh, acid soil. So I'm hoping it'll grow. Sorry, has, has, has a chap called John Bennett got the, got the parrots? Because every time a parrot noise comes up, he, his, his light's yellow. And it's uh, people are complaining on the chat that they can't hear. Sorry that's to interrupt. So that's the other view of my garden at the front. I had to redo all the rockery and get rid of all the plants away in there. So that was done last year. Boston. Different view, same garden. Nice. That's my calabrese. Um, I planted that and I wasn't quite sure what it was because I, I lose things in my garden. I haven't got an allotment. It is my back garden and it's grown in the way of Alice Fowler. And um, so everything goes everywhere. It's all mixed in flowers, vegetables, herbs nice. to get a, um, a good biosystem, eco biosystem. So I don't have to get loads of um, pesticides and things on them. It, it should all balance itself out. Well, that's the theory anyway. So I planted that. I wasn't quite sure it was. And I thought from the leaves, it's got to be a calabrese or some, something like that. Um, and then it turned out that I had three heads that looked like purple broccoli, but they were only tiny. So I chopped them off. I'm thinking, well, that's not going to get me very far. And it was, it was quite a big plant, so I was a bit disappointed. Ooh, I thought, well, I'll leave it, because if I take that out, I'm going to have a big hole. And throughout the winter, I've been having these bits of calibris keep growing. <laughs> so I just keep chopping the heads off, eating them. And then where the tiny heads are, more grow. And I've been doing that every sort of couple of weeks throughout the winter. Eventually, I found the packet seeds and it's um, purple sprouting broccoli oh. it's, that's nice that it's really been tasty and oh. very very good very good yeah. nice so that's what it looks like um as as the plant and then in the background you can see that um my, my vegetable garden is in between all these railway sleepers that used to be a pond by the previous owner Massive pond. It was about five fence panels square, I think, or three fence panels. Wow. Oh, five, five, five fence panels square. So this year, because I've got a lot of plants I leave over the winter, I don't clear everything like you would on a normal allotment. 
I leave things to decay so that there's protection for insects and wildlife. Yeah. Um, but I, because it's a very sandy soil, I realise I've got to put more compost in, which is what I've learnt from Mick, yeah. and, and obviously from the group, so that's really great. And a friend said to me, if you put your compost deep in the middle of your plot, and then keep moving it around, it will help to condition the soil and get the worms up. So I thought, well, in between my perennial plants and my alliums, I've put some cardboard, but I've also put little mounds of compost. So I've got compost um, to make my compost, I've got cardboard, and I've got sawdust from one of my, one of my son-in-law who is a carpenter and straw with manure because my daughter-in-law rides horses so I'm very lucky there and then some green waste then I cover it like Mix taught me with something some padding to keep it a little bit warmer so some of them have got one's a, a, a cotton bath mat I've thrown like that and I thought that'll do and another one is horse hair it was all matted down and part of an old mattress that I've got so I dismantled this mattress and kept this horse hair and that has really worked the best. And then I put loads of plastic bags on top and pin it down for the winter. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. That's the layout of my garden. That's the back garden as you're coming up from the house. Um, where the shed is, is where the south border is. The bottom is east. The sort of back of the house is west and then opposite is north. And where you see the, the beams, the railway beams, uh, sleepers that's where that pond was that was filled in with sand and well the local soil which is sand and pebbles so I've had to try and enrich it a bit and um, that's the front of the garden as you're leaving the house and looking onto the patio door and that is my what I call my forest so there's three trees in there and that was all overgrown when I took the garden over because he was a, a fisherman who didn't he wasn't really interested in the garden. So I was clearing everything. Oh, there we are. So we've got, that's the horse hair. It's some happy worms. Oh. Some very happy worms, they love it. And it will eventually break down and decompose. And although that looks a bit, doesn't look as good as it was, that is some of the compost from last year in my bin. I don't know how long before horse hair using that. Pardon? I haven't heard using horse hair before. Uh -huh. Well, it, it was an old mattress and it had got wool, which you have used layers of wool, which I've used to put around plants so that it stops the slugs. And then this horse hair, I didn't really know what to do for it, but I know that human hair you can put in your compost tea. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'll, and it was a light matting. So I thought, well, I'll put that on top of my compost heap and my little pound, my little mounds. And it, and it did, has caused insulation. It's worked better than the bathroom mat. The cotton that, bathroom um, hasn't done much. I think I mean, the worms thought. tell you it works, don't they? Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got compost wool, which is uh, from sheep's wool, so goat's hair, horse hair, why not? Yeah. yeah. That's so that's the, uh, the, the that's compost heap that's been, when I remove the horse hair. Yeah. That seems to keep it warm. I don't know if it's because it's more airy than the bath mat. But that and that's the northeast corner of the of the garden. But they are very happy in there. But mine don't move. It all. all you want to do is see a worm. Oh, that's the horse hair stuff. And then on top of that, there's the matting that was uh, I think toile de jute, and that was on the mattress. And I'm, I try and recycle as much as I can. So I dismantled this mattress and kept all the layers, and then got rid of the mecha bits outside. Yeah. Bro. And then you can see an alien. And this is celery act. Oh, celery. Um, and I'm not quite sure what I'm doing with it. Two years, um, was it two years ago, I bought a 20 pence worth tray of celery act, plonked it in the garden, and my friend has got an allotment, theirs got eaten. Mine is in my garden that everything just goes in anywhere. And it survived. But instead of making some nice big roots or big bulb, it just wanted to flower, so I collected the seeds and then grew those from the seeds. I, the, the bulbs are still not very big and I'm not sure when I've got to pick them or when I can eat them. Does anybody can help me? Some of us have never grown. Anybody got a clue? Anybody? Yeah, you can at any time now, yeah. Or any time. Yeah. 
But it looks big enough. It's like a cross between a swede and celery. Yeah. Nice. I've never cooked it, but I thought, well, I'll have a go. Oh. You can make mash with it. Celery up mash. That's last of my Brussels sprouts. I did really well, but I've got a very acidic soil, so brass brassicas love it. And that, that was the uh, little heads I kept getting. Well, that was my tea. And like Mick said, mmm, mmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jobbing them this year. It was very nice. Told him yesterday. And that's the other one there. I had five of those um, purple sprouting broccolis and my compost heap at the bottom. Oh, uh, nice. Rhubarb, which is doing well. That's this year's. And some uh, kale that I, I just let them grow over the winter and I just take the leaves as I want from the bottom and cook them all. and then let it grow. The, the two curly kale plants I had last year, either from Lidl as plugs, oh, wow. and the two of them lasted me all year. It's the same as any okay. spinach. Do you cover them? Like because every time I've grown it, it gets eaten. Sorry? Um, so them because every time I, I don't cover them, anything I don't exactly. cover anything I don't use um, anything to cover the veg because the idea of um, I brought my book to show you that's what it is the idea is that you create this eco environment that you're attracting predators and so I've got um, insect houses and I try and attract the birds because the sparrows come and eat a lot of the aphids I am. I have got some frogs, but I'm trying desperately to get um, a toad. So if anybody's got a toad for sale, I would love to buy it. Um, so I'm trying to attract as many um, insects as I can. So I'm attracted the predators as well. So and then the other thing as well is because it all grows mixed in, it's camouflage. So it's not like mm. all these horrible things that are growing over my garden. I'm not looking down and thinking, oh, a nice row of carrots or a nice row of yeah. what have you. Mm. They camouflage with the flowers. Mm. I do get things eaten, but not too many. Lynn, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you get excited people, don't forget you can do your little bit and all. When you need a few photos, you've just set up and everything. Right, Colin, is that your muck heap? That is, that's just down the road in the village. Um, um, and help yourself and the, the kids fill fill um bags on the left out of shot for uh people who are too idle to go and fill their own or you can have as much as you like pretty much like yours mate except yes. we don't get the liquid stuff um that's our duck eggs and uh hen's eggs there and is, that beautiful is this stable manure it's a combination, yes, yeah, stable, man stable manure, and then the film, film up, they gather up, they bag it up. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Right, that's mm -hmm. me getting the papers. If I see a worm drawing up on the footpath, I'll pick the chap up, give him the kiss of life, and put him back on the grass again. Because I'm good like that. Yeah. Right, if anybody sends me a friend request on Facebook, and there's nothing, there's no post about them. Uh, no friends, got no photos at all, then I'm, I'm not going to accept you. Don't accept them. Right, little. Look at them Gladys there. With a bag. Don't need them Gladys soon. Right, I had these a couple of weeks ago. This was from Wilco. They've, they've stocked up again. I need another good dollop. Now, I'm going to try this. This is another uh, bit of film, but it's bloody sideways. I don't know how to write, write it up. <laughs> so the, the, if you put your head on the side, they'll drop off. <laughs> See if it works. I'm going to have a dirty meat on you. I've got two more bags here. As you can see, the red red barrel. These are on here. So I'll just open that one bag up. Now what I'm going to do is rub every onion out. I mean I'm taking the old skins off. I'm also seeing if I'm nice and firm. Because they ain't if I'm cracked. I skin. And it gets thin. There's another difference. It don't look very well. If it don't look very well, it ain't very well. So I want. All I want is nice, solid, full. Yeah. Back in there. Because I know they're... 
all the nice and strong roller coasters. Not weak in any way. So any soft ones, soft necks, anything like that. If you're undecided, like in the other bit, you can turn them off. Any other stuff that you want them to be pretty. So I'll go through them on all and just uh I've got a bit of crap on the bottom so it can clear off the ground. Too small. Easy to be really weak. So rub all the skins off. This is nice and firm so we get broken out as well. I'll then do the other bag as well and then I'll put them on. Here's some I made earlier. Now I've just pulled that one out just to show you. If I'd have planted him out in the on the plot, I could have lost that gap because he ain't done so at all. I mean he's got root, but no um top at all on it. Meaning he's weak. So if there's any disease, anything good about aphids, no, which is a weak plant and that's what I was before. So clear him off. First of all right. Then when I started off in eating, bumped them out in the cold green air. These were starting in the cold green air. So these have had minus four and five. So they're coming on. So that's what these were eventually be. <laughs> Full size seeds, try 15 try in third. Let me pass your cups. Or a cup there with the lemon. So that's, that's just basically check everyone. Get all the old skins off. If, uh, you know, if they don't tell us any good, they do. Right, that works, so I ain't got to explain it now. So, I've got, I've got enough out on them any road. Right, I found that somebody um, asked about a question during the week about they took a plot on, which I had exactly the same <laughs> when I took my plot on, they got mare's tail. Ah. And it was ruining, well, it, well, well, quite a few of the plots have got them. And quite a few on our side have still got mare's tail. Now, when I took it on, this is all I used to get rid of mine, and I've still got rid of it now. It's a glass of eight, obviously, and it's tumbleweed gel. And I've mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, but I've found the bottles out now. And the, the brush is in the lid itself. And all you do is paint the axles of the one mare's tail. And it's uh, systemic, so the, the mare's tail absorbs it, takes it down to the roots. Now, if you've got different mare's tail coming all over your plot, You've only got to do about every six mares tail, a distance about 12 feet, because there's loads of mares tail coming up from one stem. So you've only got to do two of them mm. to jib the roots. But this does kill it off. Now, as I mentioned before, if the, the, I know Wilco still flog glyphosate. If you get a weed killer, for the money sprays. But look on the small print on the back for a systemic one. But, uh, and then just pour it in a little cup or something and use an old brush and just do uh, exactly the same again. Because this went off the market about 10 years ago. But it does get rid of your, your mare's tail. Right, select seeds are sent from some more seeds. As you'll see the postman there, Mr. M. Poulton, the compost king, so the postman knows where to go. <laughs> Right, well, getting me cups ready and me, um, <coughs> me multi-purpose compost mixed with vermiculite. My old label from last year, what I used to do was scrub them off and clean them all of the new. Just cut the ends off and start again. Easier. Right, <coughs> sweet corn's a new one. Purple sprouting, that was a new one. And me calabrese. All I want is five seeds in each pot. I only want a couple of plants, so my mate will be having the spares. If you've got a good eyesight, you can see me uh, five seeds in, in the pot there. Yeah. Sweet corn, look like me, uh, they're a bit hard, so I'm going to soak them overnight and come back to them. Calabrese, them are going in as well. When I put my vermiculite on top, I do, just put the cup in the bucket, then there's no uh, wastage or spillage or if there is it goes back into the bucket give her a nice watering and then throw them in the propagator and bung the lid on okay. still got ventilation on top of the 
propagator. You don't want them sweating that much. In the last couple of days, they've even been wedged out higher than this. This was earlier on in the week. Had two good days of sun now. In fact, yesterday and today, it's like a bloody summer's day. Uh, deep clean. Just in case any bugs about little chaps, aphids, I'm going to start getting active now. Then I'll spray everything as a deterrent when the sun is off them, obviously. Right, tray inserts. If you buy these, these go in a 15 tray insert, go inside a full size seed tray. If you go to Wilco and see these, the ones on the left are quite solid. That tray on the right is flimsy, meaning it's not going to last. So you either get the chapins or the dearest. As you can see there, they're very fl flimsy. But I only put cups in them anyway, just for transporting, so I'm okay. A couple of holes in the bottom, drainage holes, and I'll fill them up. Uh, and get my sets ready. And they're just sitting in, shoulders sticking out the top. Mm -hmm. Upright. And then I give them a nice wagering outside and let them drain through. Once I've drained through, I'll give them another soak and make sure all the compost has been jobbed. So I then come back in the cold end of the greenhouse, obviously. As you can see now, we're filling up slowly. Right, this is a Colligate Garden Club. This is our annual mm -hmm. old show. Now, Monday, i.e. tomorrow, myself, Gene and Mike have got a, a committee meeting to sort out or try and sort out if we can have a show or not our show is the second week in september meaning well is the place still going to be open we've got to find that out first and then if it is if there's any social distancing i.e the six foot there's no way we can have it because this mm. place has got seating all the way around and we sit everybody down we need them sat down for the auction when we auction everything off so we've got to try and sort some it out tomorrow or look, look into it any road. Right, this is a uh, Jeffrey sent me this photo. Somebody took it from uh, Iceland. Fancy seeing that floating past your window on the morning when you get up. We're on a hill. Who's our next speaker? Colin, you ready, mate? Uh, Nigel? Yes, mate. Yeah. Good man. Right, Nigel Cole, we've had him a, a couple of times down our garden club for the talk. He's a good lad. He's in the British Gladiator Society. Secretary, is that right? Uh, editor. Editor. That's even better, right? Uh, I'm vice president. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's a good lad. He's on um, Facebook as well. And uh, But uh, I'll let, you, let him talk you through this. Thank you. Um, all yours, Nigel, mate. Okay, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks. Evening, everybody. Nice to be with you. Um, yeah, Mick asked me for us together a few photos of um, sort of what we should be doing with the glads at this time of year. Um, basically, the biggest problem at this time of year, especially when it's a warm day like it's been today, is uh, keeping your hands in your pockets and not doing anything, really. Um, but uh, in the next couple of weeks, the, the corn suppliers should be, um, should be sending um, corns out that people have ordered probably back in sort of September, October, November time. Um, that tends to be the way that the um, the few firms that are still trading uh, work. You put your order in before Christmas and then they sit there sort of 15-20% um, on and send the forms out in uh, springtime. They'll send them out in net bags. Um, getting the forms uh, breathing is, is, the, is the main thing really at, the, at this time of year. You don't want them to be packed in paper bags or polythene bags where they're sweating and things like that. So uh, once the corns arrive, get them out of the bags and uh, stack them in, in something like uh, these mushroom trays. I think these are absolutely fantastic. Um, I was quite fortunate that I managed to get about 80 of them for nothing from a chap down the road a few years ago. Um, and uh, we, we store them in them. Um, first thing to do really is is when it comes to about two or three weeks before planting time is, is take the husks off them. Gladiol lie corns are covered in a protective husk. Um, and there's two or three reasons for doing that really. First, as you can see here, 
that they can be hiding all kinds of nasty diseases and things. So um, if, you, if you peel the paper, it husks off when you end up seeing something like this, um, throw it out. You'll never, you'll never rescue that in, in a month of Sundays. So that needs to be sort of kicked out. Um, but also you need to have a look at them because um, they can have, have insects harboring in between the layers of husk. Uh, and the third reason is to take the eyes out. Um, sounds a bit dramatic taking the eyes out, but when you're growing gladioli for showing, you want all the goodness of that particular corn to go into producing one fantastic flower. And a gladiolus <laughs> corn is a bit like a potato, it's got various eyes on it. So you need to take them all out apart from the one that you think is the strongest. Uh, and as you can see here, it's usually the one nearest to the center of the corn. So um, previous slide, if you can just whip it back one Mick, please. Previous slide, this is, this is my, along with my little hand fork, this is my uh, prize, prize possession as regards gardening goes. This is a fantastic tool for DIY in gladioli forms. And those of you in the know will realize that it's a potato peeler. Um, and the, um, the right hand side of it there has got a lovely scalloped end on it that just gets right underneath the uh, shoots and scoops them out. Okay, Mick. So uh, you can see there, the top and the bottom, we've managed to remove uh, a couple of excess shoots, leave one just good, good, nice one. And that's what you really should be looking for. Lovely clean corn, free of blemishes and disease, and uh, a one fantastic shoot ready to go. <clears throat> and that's what it looks like close up. You've got to re dig really deep down and scoop it out. Otherwise, it's uh, if you leave any of the sort of growth material in there, it will try and regenerate again from the, from the same space. So um, ah. make, make sure you clear it out. That's me. Uh, that's what you should end up with, really. Uh, nice, nice tray full of uh, nice, nice cleaned up forms. Little shoots on the top, ready to go. Um, as you'll see here, there's a various, various sizes uh, of form. Um, we'll see a bit later on when, it, when we show you some form sizes. But basically, the uh, the, the adage that sort of bigger, bigger is best doesn't really sort of hold up for for gladiol life. Um, you'll get decent flowers off off anything bigger than a sort of 10 pence piece and you'll even get flowers off a 20 pence piece size form um so uh you know don't don't always sort ahead for the biggest ones excuse me so as i say here you go various sizes um <clears throat> probably about the sort of second one down from the top is what you'd be looking for you want something about the size of a 50 pence piece a little bit bigger um but anything down to as i say 20 pence piece size will give you a decent form um, and, a, and a, a reasonable flower. If you show it, if you want them to show it, but you'll want something about the size of a 50 pence piece or a little bit bigger, really. Excuse me. When you're buying your corns, though, if you do get the chance to sort of uh, go rooting around in a bag in the garden centre of one of these sort of fill, you know, filler bag as many as you can get in it for a couple of quid, or you can see through the, the, the mesh of the bag or even if you're sorting your own corns out at home, always, always tip them upside down. No matter if they've got a shoot on the top, they're not ready for planting until you can see those little root nodules beginning to swell around the basal scar. Okay. The basal scar is where last year's corn sat, and this new one was produced on top of it. So when I say don't look for a big corn, what you're really looking for is a small basal scar in relation to the rest of the corn. So if you've got a small scar on a big corn, give it the jackpot. Um, but a nice big fleshy fleshy corn like that with a small root scar is, is perfect. But don't plant them until those root nodules growing around the base of the scar have begun to swell. Because once, once they've started to swell, that's the roots beginning to develop. You put it into cold ground without those um, or even warm ground without those, it will take them a while to get growth going. But once those root nodules are going, pop them in the ground and, and they'll uh, get a good start. They'll kick off straight away and they'll, um, they'll give you a good start for the season. Before I plant any of mine though, I always, once it, once it sort of peels, um, Usually the day before I plant them, I give them a dip in a, a fungicide stroke insecticide solution. Um, 
Now, the, these are uh, becoming a bit sort of more difficult to find in garden centres and various places now. As, Can I ask uh, a question? Yeah. Um, go back to the previous slide, don't need to, but the, um, you put them into the ground, you start, you, do you start them off in pots at all? You know, I'm often asked that question and I, I, I sort of, my answer is why? Why would you want to? Um, I, I, I'm I just think just, just for a decent root system to start with, if, if you've got, if, if it's a bit cold and you know the weather is going to be a bit warmer in two weeks and you want to just, if you've got a show date that you want to hit. The, the show dates, the show dates in Britain aren't really sort of uh, dependent on, on sort of getting an early start on any forms really. I mean, okay. I don't, I, I'm in the Midlands, I'm on the edge of the Peak District in Derbyshire. Um, so you probably all know how, how sort of chilly it can get up there. Um, and I plant from the last week in April through to last week in May, possibly the first couple of days of June. And I can get flowers from that planting from the second week in August all the way through to the end of September. Okay, fine. Um, but I, 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 I take your point and I, and I know some growers do do it and I've seen photos in the last few days of somebody that's got some growing in the greenhouse. Um, the one thing I would say that if, if you've got problems with sort of things, you know, pests like rabbits or a lot of slugs or anything like that, if you've got a, a bit of a plant growing in a pot and it's, and it's got some strong leaves growing, obviously they're going to be a bit less of an easy target for any pests. So, um, so you could gain a bit there, but what you might lose is um, they don't really like having the roots disturbed. So um, I've, I've always gone down the line that, um, you know, I'll, I'll wait for the soil to warm up, I'll wait for my corms to break dormancy, I'll put them in and uh, they, they flower when they flower. So the other question is to do with soil. What's the um, ideal soil? Would you grow them in raised beds? Raised just beds. normal normal raised spent raised compost? Beds, yeah, raised beds is a great idea. Um, basically, um, Gladys are, are all bred really from sort of or the, the, the ones that we see at shows and you, you see in the garden centres are all bred, bred a couple of years, a couple of hundred years ago from sort of South African species ones. Yeah. Um, so if you think what the soil's like in sort of South Africa, it's quite dry and, and sandy and well drained. So that's what you're looking for is a well drained soil. But um, on, on the opposite side, they do like loads of water and the more water you can get at them the more buds they'll have on the flower spike and that makes them a better show prospect so the the, uh, the idea is really to sort of uh, try and get a layer of organic material in the in the soil somewhere so that your corn is sitting just above it nice and dry and well drained but the roots can actually tap into that water supply just below thank you um, so, um, but I'm, I'm quite lucky where I am, mixed into my plot, and it's, it sits in the bottom of a bit of a river valley, and um, it, it can absolutely lash it down for days on end, and two or three days after it stopped raining, I can get on and come away with no mud on my boots, you know. It's, uh, in fact, this time, this year, I've, I've put in um, a ton of uh, mushroom compost just to try and get it to hold a bit more water during the summer. Just a quick question, if you can put in there, Nigel. Yeah. Follow on from Nick. You mentioned about looking to get the root nodules to start to swell. Yeah. Do they need a minimum temperature to actually start moving? And do you also, do you give them any moisture spray or anything? No, I, I, I store my corns in my, in my roof space in the house um, over the winter. Uh, and it's, it's pretty well insulated up there. It gets, it gets quite cool in the, in the winter time. It keeps them nice and quiet, but, um, uh, and I'm usually up there sort of three or four times over the winter looking at them, you know, sort of put them up there in November time. And when I get the Christmas tree out in December, I have a look at them, make sure they're all right. When I put the Christmas tree back in sort of first week of January, I have another look at them. Uh, and um, usually round about sort of first, second week in March, when you start having a look at them and the temperatures outside is a bit warmer and the, the sun's beating down on the house roof it sort of wakes them up anyway. Um, they don't really need any moisture to get them going. Um, it's just that warm. So if, uh, you know, if there was, if there were slow in breaking dormancy, just, just 
bring them in, in and put them somewhere a bit warmer or in the greenhouse where you've got a bit of a high temperature, you know. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry to keep this subject going. Two quick questions. Second one is, um, yeah, I understand the corns because I've grown them myself, not for competition, just for the garden. <laughs> the first one is, would you store them in a garage above freezing? The three things you need when you're storing them is cool, dry, and a bit of air circulation. Yeah. So garage, nice and cool, as long as you have, you know, your central heating boiler and loads of copper pipes when you're not walking around the side of your garage. Um, dry, you know, as long as your roof's not leaking yet. Air, you know, if you're going in and out of your garage frequently, you're getting a bit of air circulation. And the fact that we've got them in those plastic mushroom comp uh, trays, mushroom trays with the holes pierced in them, means that the air can get underneath and through and what have you. So, yeah, basically that's it. I've, I've known people sort of try and keep them in greenhouses and things like that, where it can get a bit a bit damper, shall we say. Yeah. That doesn't always work. So, um, so yeah, I wouldn't have a problem for it. And the last question is, obviously, the supermarkets sell them and garden centres. Is there any specific varieties that the judges would be looking for? Or is it just uniformity you're looking for? Um, it depends on the level of competition. I suppose it's the same, you know, if, you, if you're showing vegetables and stuff like that, you know. If, if you go down the local sort of village hall, you know, you'll, you'll probably see you know, a, a few sort of onions, carrots and stuff like that, that people have just pulled out the back garden and thought, well, you know, well, I'll put them in because, um, you know, I'll support the show. But if you're taking them to sort of like Malvern or somewhere like that, you yeah. know, you grow, you're growing your sort of sweet candle carrots and gladiator parsnips and either mesas leeks and things like that, because they are the best varieties. And there are better varieties for show purposes. Um, and without being sort of too downbeat about it, you you won't see many of those in the garden centres. Yeah, yeah, same as you, same you as the onion. Fan, you get stuff. some fantastic blooms in garden centres. You get some fantastic forms. Um, the, the, there's an old Dutch one called Trader Hall, which is red with a white dart in its throat. That's a lovely one. Um, and um, one or two of, of the other Dutch varieties, Cream Perfection, is another one that you might find. But if you went to the sort to sort of Harrogate show or the British Gladiolus Society National Show, which is usually held at Poynton, um, your, your top winning varieties would all be sort of out of specialist catalogues. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, back on the soil sort of thing, you know, I've, um, we used to have a mushroom farm up the road. It's it disappeared now, so I'll have to bring it in from a bit further afield. Um, but put your mushroom compost into the soil is great if you can get it sort of down about sort of six, seven inches deep, just below where your corn's going to be sitting. And that will sort of more, retain the moisture, the roots will tap into it and, and they'll, they'll take up the, the water and give you a better flower spike. And as I said, the, the corn itself needs to be sort of well drained. So the best idea is to sort of put a handful of grit or sharp sand or vermiculite into your planting hole, sit your corn on top of it, another handful on top and the roots go down through that, that um, material into the, into the water supply, take up what they need um, and the corn itself so it's nice and dry and the, the added bonus is doing it this way is that when you harvest the corns later on in the year or um, October time you're lifting out of a nice sort of dried um, environment and mm. so things you can be doing this year uh, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of growing your own stock um, we, we're down really to about two or three main gladiolus specialist suppliers in the UK now and sort of, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn but they, they may not be going for too much longer so I'm a big advocate of growing your own sort of stock on and I, do, I use these 30 litre tree pots that I've made them. I usually grow about 30, 40 pots a year. So um, over the, the first six sort of, uh, I do a couple of weeks before I want to start planting. And this was, as you can see, there's snow on the ground here. So this is two or three weeks ago. Give them all the good scrub out and make sure they, they sort of screw for this and clean. Excuse me. 
Yeah. Just a quickie uh, there, Nigel. Let me come. Put in the 30 litre bucket. What car parts do it? No, not uh, how many combs? Is it one Sorry, every combs in the bucket? <clears throat> these are cormlets. Usually about twelve to fifteen. I think these these are cormlets, not flowering size combs. These are baby ones that I'm growing on this year for to make flowering size combs next year and the year after. So it, it's a sort of ongoing process. Um, so you, these are the little ones, the bulblets that grow around the base of the main corn. I take them off, save them over the winter, um, say take the 30 litre pot, stick with a potting compost. Um, I have got a favourite one, it's Petersfield number two potting compost. Um, and uh, about, about anywhere between 12 and 15 cornlets, the size of your little fingernail in a pot. Uh, next one Mick please. What, what would the, the flowering time be for them cormlets to produce a yeah, decent size flower? Yeah. Well, they'll, they'll produce a good corn. That's all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for a flower. I'm looking for a decent bulb for next year. So if they try to flower, they'll usually try to flower about sort of September time, same as, same as the, the larger flowered ones. But if they try to flower, the idea is nip the flower spike off, keep the leaves growing as long as you can because they're feeding the bulb underground. And from something the size of, a, of, of my little fingernail, I'll be harvesting something the size of, uh, easy, easily of a 10 pence, 50 pence piece. And that will flower with a, with a sort of competition size bloom next year. Okay. Uh, I uh, um, so, you know, it's no, I don't. it depends on the size of the cormlet that you plant. So the bigger the cormlet that you plant, the bigger it will be when you harvest it. Nigel, why, why do you need um, such a large... And the large... depth in the pot. Yes, mate. What, just a quick question. Uh, um, why do you need such a large... Why do I need such a large pot? Capacity pot for the tiny little corms. Um, because they, by the time they flower, they'll be about two foot, two and a half foot high, um, and and they'll have as many leaves on them as as a, as a full size one. All oh, right. Okay. No. Can I ask a question, please? Hello. Can Isn't I ask a? Two? Yeah, we got cut out there for a minute. Hello. Um. I grow a few gladiolos just because I love the things. Yeah. Um, but they've been in the ground for about five years. Do you think it's about time I dug them up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, years, years ago, we always used to say, "Don't, don't leave them in the ground because they won't stand the winter." But the winters we've had lately, it's, you yeah. know, it's been fine. I mean, apart from this one, with a bit, bit nippy. But uh, so, uh, yeah, if 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 you leave them in the ground gradually, because each corm is producing those little baby ones, like we saw on the pot in the pot there. Mm. Uh, eventually you'll get lots and lots of little babies, all producing leaves, all fighting for the nutrients, and they'll they'll get it to the detriment of the flower inside corn. So every every three, four, five years, flip the clump up and, and you know, dot them around or hand them out to friends and things like that. So when is the good time to dig them up? Um really after they've flowered end, so end of the season so i can't go out and do it tomorrow then no because if they're in the ground now they've probably already started growing and you'll dis you'll disturb the roots uh-huh okay thank you ever so much okay. so the the, my, the picture of my finger there, there really is is to just show you the depth of the of the planting of the form that's in the pot so two two and a half inches deep um and then then they'll pull themselves probably down themselves with the contractile roots about another inch um, and that's what they look like when they're all set out. I'm a bit OCD. I've got them all laid out nice and neat. Um, all, labelled, all labelled up and uh, and sort of uh, ready for uh, for the sunshine and the rain of spring to get them growing. Well, well. 
Okay, Mick, I think that's yeah. That's one, Mick. No. So, as you as uh, what it call in the task? Why I why I got yeah. Um, yeah. The big pots? They are calling that. Oh, oh there you go. Like it. Yeah. In July. <laughs> um, and they've got, they've got another three months to grow in to do then. Um, I. I don't know. You you may you may have answered this previously, and I missed it. But how long before these produce corms that will produce a flower? I would be expecting that at least fifty percent of these that are in the pots here will be going out into my allotment the following year to to produce show flowers. All oh, right, that's two uh, years cycle then. Yeah, yeah. That depends on on the size of the actual corm that you planted. When some varieties naturally produce big cormlets and don't. Um, so um, any, anything that's the size of your sort of little fingernail or a bulb should should give you a good flowering size corm in one season. How deep do you plant the cormlets? They're about two, two and a half inches deep. Oh, in thank you. Um, and you can feed and water them as much as you want. And yeah. They'll feed them. Um, and just as a, 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 another aside here, if you're thinking of sort of propagating your own stock on and you're feeling very brave, you can actually slice through a fully mature, full-size corn as long as you leave a shoot and part of the root scar mm -hmm. on the section that you take. So this one's been cut in half. The right-hand side there, you can see the shoot underneath it and the root scar at the top. The left-hand side one, still a shoot on the top of it, the root scar underneath. The one thing you just need to be a bit aware of is uh, to um, just make sure that the, the open wound is dusted with something like a fungicide powder, <coughs> green sulphur, just to sort of stop any mould or anything like that developing. And each one of those will produce another corm on top of it. So from one corm, you've then got two of the, the, the following season. It's a good way of doing it if you've got varieties that don't naturally produce a lot of little baby cornlets around them. Mm. Yeah. Nigel, right. excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Very interesting. Yeah, very good. You're welcome. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, Nigel. Right, the, this is our hound of the garden. This is a couple of days ago. It was the first day of sun. Don't you, you look after that dog, don't you? I can sit her in the sun and not work in the greenhouse. But as a proper poultry, Neil loves the sun. <laughs> we all do. Right, back of the garden. I'm going to get some it out. These are under cover. It's the front that's open. I'm going to get my shallots out. I get me cover off. These beds prepared end of last season. Fish, blood and bone sprinkling over the top. And then it's just scattered with a hand fork. The hand fork only disturbs the top half inch of the soil so these are the large exhibition shallots going out Edo look very well meaning is going straight in the bin Shame. nice bit of space so these are spaced out i'm also going to throw a bit of mic under his iris to give them a kick as well <laughs> i should start everything off in the greenhouse as a seedling and then put Mick, why do you give them so much space with such a small plant they need it. Them roots are going to go down and uh, after all the grub they want. The stronger the root system, the stronger the top, the roots on to, the plants on top. What you need is when they when they come, uh, when they're mature plants, they're going to start smacking into each other. Yeah. When so, do you expect to harvest these? When? Yeah. Uh, it's supposed to be um, <coughs> longest day and shortest day. And what will you put in after them? Uh, nothing. No? No. You don't put any beet or carrots or yeah. brassicas? I'm going to throw on me, on me one and a half pots or the rest of the garden for other stuff. If I need it, if I hadn't got much room, I needed the, the space, then then I'll plant somewhere else. But I, I have done the spare chilli plants in these after. Okay. But the, the last couple of years, I had many spares. Because I either bung one out, bring them by. Oh. Can you see that there? Bloody McQueen. Okay. So firming these in, all I do is push the soil, the growing medium, around the outside. I don't push on top of the shallot itself. 
I don't want to squash them roots. Mm. So the, the soil is just going firm in around it, around the outside. So the back row's got in, and then the next one. This is probably about a 18 inch between either of them. Right, they've all been firmed in. I then level the, the growing medium around all of them. Right, now we're still going to get frost as we've had the, the last couple of days because we've had decent sunny days, so you're going to have frost on the night. Exactly the same with all my other raised beds. As soon as I've planted some it out, the next thing I'm going to do is top dress with straw. Yep. This will now look after them if we do get a good frost. We'll look after the roots anyway. Because the next thing I'm going to do when you plant some it is water it. And if you have a good frost that same night, obviously these this was put out before we had the frost. But the worst thing you have to do is have a good frost after you wait to summer. But using straw, the only one disadvantage with raised beds is they dry out quick. Mm. But I found out, even with gladdies, once my gladdies have come through, I then top dress with straw with them as well. Mm. Looks after them. Keeps the warmth and moisture in. Keeps keeps the weed. Well, you won't get no bloody weeds anyway, because I, I don't dig. So I don't bring the weed seeds, dormant weed seeds to the surface. Mm -hmm. Right, that cover I've got up, I'm going to dry off. Then I roll him up and then I get my little uh, Velcro strips, which we'll cover later on. Then he goes back in the in the shed. Where did you get your Velcro from, Mick? we come on to that in a bit. Yeah, I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down, dear. <laughs> There's what I, I, I use this for loads of things. This build is a uh, damp course on the left, and I use that to go around my blanch leaks as well with the Velcro strips. But these are great for runner beans, anything well. But uh, we'll, we'll see them in a bit. Right, my swing corn a bit. These are swelled up. So then we're going in. Five to a pot. Bit of vermiculite. And then give them a good waiter. Also, somebody mentioned during the week about taking your own seeds from a, you know, a good, decent pepper from the supermarket or something. Can you store them all? Yeah. But if you ain't got a propagator, just put them in the airing cupboard. Um, obviously, you've got to keep an eye on the on the tissue. It's got to stay moist to get germination. But uh, it's easier for me to put it in the propagator. I, I, I check it daily anyway, so it can make sure it doesn't dry out. But if you ain't got a propagator, bung it in there and it could keep an eye on it. Right, this is um, Joanne from Manchester. I sent me a couple of photos in about seaweed. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I said bunch of photos in there. Oh, that's, look at that. Mmm, heaven. Mm. That's heaven for any Midlander. <laughs> and there's a hound. While he's collecting seaweed, the, the hound's having some exercise. Look at that. Beautiful stuff. And he gets it back on, bunks it in the compost heap. Damn. I should be getting some of that soon off my mate. Mm -hmm. This is down Wilco uh, last Monday. Loads of gladdies in. Right, you can see that Velcro tape on the right. Also there, we've got the wire, which I use for me... Uh, leaks. Wire for me leaks and my onion ceilings on the left as well. So we'll have a closer curve. Hook tie strips, I call them. I don't know they don't call it Velcro, I don't know. But there's two dollops there, but uh, they're going to last you youngs. And yeah, there's sure. loads of things you can use them for. Now, they used to, I think about three years ago, I used to have a, a bloody great roll of them. I know B&Q still do the big rolls, but these are the only ones I do now because I asked them money when it went down. When 30 metres is long enough, I suppose, unless you leave, leave the loads on them. But they ain't bad for a quid. Mm. Uh, they, they were stocked up again Monday. Because don't forget, uh, this whole, uh, Wilco's open Saturdays and Sunday, so quite a few shop on the weekend, and, but they do stock up overnight, obviously now, because they, they know gardeners are active, so yeah. they know they're going to flog the stuff, and they, they, they flog uh, stocking up on everything. And there were spuds in, onion sets, garlic, ginger, even got ginger in, strawberry plants, 
rhubarb, loads of stuff in. So they are looking after the garden. And the vermiculite, 10 litres for 650 robin sods. But I suppose if you want it, you get it. Right, while I was in there, white lady, I've done them a flower. So I'm going to add a packet to them. And also the spinach. Looks very similar to the stuff I've been yomping the last couple of weeks, which I found. And it tastes beautiful. Okay. And you can sell this from uh, Feb onwards. So that's gone in as well. Because it was the baby spinach. I think the first one I had from uh, I can't remember. But then I found Lidl. It, uh, Lidl had it last week. And now I've got the seed myself. So I'm sowing them as well. But the taste of this is beautiful. Not like the spinach I used to get at school. Which is vile. Right, where am we? Alstrom area. This is on the, the front of the house. Now you see the two plants there. The frost has jobbed them. I've just mm -hmm. left them in. I'm going to have a quick perv. And you can see there's new shoots. They've started oh. shooting already. Because they've got that bit of protection around them. Uh, normally, I would have took all them, that old stuff off. Like I did with the stuff up the back garden. But I left these there. Because they were still flowering. Until we had a good frost. That's why I left them. And then going to have a perv to prune them. I thought, well, there's new shoots there. But the old growth is protecting them. So I've left them as they are. But then there was a, a, a good flowering as well. They, they give us a good show. Right, runny beans. I'm showing some of them earlier because I'm going to plant them in, inside, obviously. But uh, you got to soak them as well. You ain't got it, but I do. But uh, that's, that's doing me spinach. These are quite big seeds. I only want five in again. I only need a couple for myself. So a bit of vermiculite on top, wedroom, and bungum in me propagator. A little bit of a tissue drying out, so it give me a drop of wedroom as well. Get rid of that one. Right, that's how it's looking at the moment. Uh, that, that's filling up the warm end of the greenhouse. Is that a little aphid in the middle of that uh, Austin No, it wasn't. Luckily, I'll get a slug like him on me. Uh, Goodness, That's having him as a pet. <laughs> That's what this was. <laughs> Gordon Bennett. Nigel. Hello there. Your cue, sir. Okay. If anybody's on um, on YouTube, mm. if you want to learn something about gardening. Uh, Muddy Boots he's, he's known as on there. Look at his followers. He's got hordes on him. I can't understand the bloody word he says. Anyway, I have a lot of money, Mick, I think. <laughs> Welcome, oh, Nigel. All yours, mate. Okay, that's uh, an aerial view of the site. I'm on. I'm the secretary. There's uh, 21 plots in total, 17 full size, and there's four divided up in half plots. Um, it's a council run plot with th 55 quid a year for one plot and 30 quid a year for a half plot. We've got running water on there, parking and toilets. And my house, if you look at the picture, right in the middle, you can see a half moon conservatory. That's my back garden. And where the arrow is now, where mixed book, that's my plot. So I just come through the gate in the fence straight onto my lawn. Right. Oh, nice. Jammy sod. I mean, jammy person. <laughs> jammy sod. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mick. Well, that's a little bit of an aerial view of one end of my plot. The first part there is, is the um, Enviro Mesh Cage. That there is 18 foot long by about 8 foot wide. And in there, I've got my uh, alliums, my onions, leeks, and garlic. Stuff like that, it's a brown shallot. The next bed along on the left, that's my potato bed. This year I've grown all my potatoes in 30 litre containers purely because I hate digging potatoes up. I usually spear the biggest potato. The best one. Today, <laughs> today I've, um, I've got, um, I've still got eight buckets of saw in the in the container. I've dug one up today, emptied one out today, and I've got a huge 
I don't know, I haven't weighed it, but it's, it's full a mushroom basket right to the very top of it. And in between the main crops are parts, if you look, them and my sunflowers. Each year, I, there's a guy named Nick in Cheshire, I think he runs a competition, sunflower competition. And I've won it three out of four years with the biggest sunflower, the giant head on it. Yeah, I think last last year I got one uh, 21 and a half inches. It was the head on it. The, the bed farther next to long there, on the left, the little cage, I've got the strawberries in the hoops, the blue hoops. Moving inwards, I've got my um, salad bed. Then the, the bed behind it there, it's, it's where I've got my peas. We're bombarded with a squadron of sparrows there and they keep taking the tops out, so I've ended up having to net them. In the middle there with the green barrier netting around, that's my outdoor tomatoes. And I only grow now Crimson Crush, which is a blight resistant. It's not blight free, but it's blight resistant. We've had blight on the site, which has wiped all the taters out. It's funny but you I... should uh, talk about that Crimson Crush, because I just ordered some today. Are they, yeah. are they good outside, are they? I've got cherry ones as well. I, I actually grow indoors on the greenhouse and outside, and I find the flavour is better from the outdoor ground ones. And what's the yield like? Fantastic. The about two years ago on my YouTube, I did a, a comparison. There was three brands out at the time. There's a lot more now. There was Crimson Crust, one called Furline, another one called Mountain Magic. And I grew them side by side for the yield. And, and Crimson Crush just about won it on the yield, but the flavour, I did a taste test. And for me, that was the one. Yeah. I got some off Premier Seed, some F1 Seed, ordered some yesterday. Yeah, they do a good deal. If you buy a little packet, you'll pay two or three quid. But I think Premier, do you can buy like 100 seeds for about 10 quid, I think. In, yeah, I, I, I think I had 12 for 99p. That, that's a good price. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you get to something like Sutton's, it'll be about three quid. Yeah, I mean, an, anybody listening, use Premier Seeds. Everything I grow is more or less from Premier Seeds for the eating. Yeah, next to the next to the tomatoes, the little three white herbs that was my celery, and I had a disaster this year. Normally, I'll grow one called Livum, which is the self blanching. It's not a trenching one. And I, I, had a, I always have a good crop off that. I always dig a huge trench out at the bottom, line it with cow manure, then put the compost on the top because it keeps it moist regardless of the weather. And the worst thing you can do is let the celery dry out. But this year, I changed the, I couldn't get my, my normal variety. I tried something else. And I had like a celery blight come on it and it wiped the crop out in no time. Mm. The thing with the little cage around it there is my um, Swede. I had a disaster with them this year as well. For some years, for some reason, they've grown like long radishes rather than ball enough. And the bed the other side is my parsnips. I always grow gradiator. Um, I, I tend to bang a, a metal pile in the ground about 15, 18 inches deep, form a cone, then I put sift, I usually put an F2S down in the hole. Then I put a little drain pipe collar on the top, plant about so about five seeds, then I let them all grow, then then I, I pick I don't actually pull the seedlings out, I cut off the ones that I don't want to use at, at soil level, just risk that I don't damage the one I want to keep. And I always get a reasonably good size parsnip off them. And the bed right behind there where you can see through, that's my brassica cage, and that's netted as well. And it's when I first took my allotment on, I netted probably about one or two beds. Now it's got to a stage where there's about one or two beds that are not netted. Because there's yeah. What do you think about you've got your brassica cage there? I, I hear so much about crop rotation and I don't crop rotate and I've never had, I don't get problems. I always ro rotate. As you can see them there now, the brassica bed will move where the crimson crushed tomatoes. Everyone will move upwards and the onions now are down from this year coming and where the brassicas are going to be. I mean, it's I a huge think. subject, isn't it? But yeah. um, I, 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 I've i grown cabbage and broccoli uh, in raised beds, the same for the last three or four years at home. Yeah. Um, only only small amounts, three or four of each. Yeah. But I, I've had no problems whatsoever. Yeah, there's, there's about 70-odd uh, plants in there. Um, we get a lot of club root on our site and... Wait. Mix, mix mentioned it earlier. I've used the uh, pearl cap, but okay. before that, I used to use our millitox in the soil as well. Yeah. But now I, do, I tend to put a, I lime the beds a lot, 
and also I put a good handful of lime in the planting hole and really firm them in when I plant them in and they seem to do well with that. You feed yeah, lime in all your beds, do you? No, I, I always do a pH check. Obviously, if I've had potatoes in before, it's going to be quite acidic, the soil is, so then I'll lime it to bring the, all to the pH again. Okay. You know, uh, you know you're know, you saying you're sort of 90% netting over your crops. Yes. And I, I, don't, I can remember my granddad had an allotment sort of 70 years ago and I can't ever remember him covering anything no, up. No, no. And he used to have magnificent. Well, there's not the water allium leaf mine around of them, which we get hammered with on our side yeah, as well. Yeah. It seems to be prevalent in the Midlands for some reason. Yeah. Does it not depend on your early crops? Because if you plant early spring, um, it, you, you know, brassicas, you tend not to get the uh, cabbage butterfly and that type of thing. But come June, if you, if, you, if you start a later crop, you tend to get the problems then. Well, well I, I, with my brassicas, I try to get two crops in. Yeah. Especially with like stuff like calabrese and that. I, I've got some now, probably about three or four inches high. Then I'll sow some more, probably the end of March, early April. And, and I'll be cropping then up until September, October. <laughs> okay, make next one. Yep. That's how I, I mentioned I did my parsnips. I knocked that pole in down about 18 inches. It puts a deep hole and I rotate to form a cone. And then I, I fill that with FOS. And, and that's what I do. Like you do your show <laughs> vegetables, isn't it? Get a nice, 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 nice start to them. Yeah, but I'll need, uh, rather than growing them in like a big sandbox, I, I, I'll just grow straight in the ground. You do lose the taproot when you fetch a made what I mean. I'll eat that. Nigel, that's not your Aston Villa bobber. <laughs> that, that's the still act, that's the wall still. And that's I use one of these for sifting the compost. It's a road for a sieve. You can get them from uh, tool station, uh, not tool station, and um, what's it called now? It's one of one of the company machine mart, and they're about thirty odd quid. And just turn the handle, and it comes out like flour. It does. It's fantastic sieve. It is better than riddling it. Mm. Can you put a link up for that? I'll, I'll sort you a link in a minute, Nick. Now, probably. Um, I mentioned about what doing parsnips. Them are the collars I put round. I have filled the conical holes with F2S. I put them. Them are drain pipes, three-inch drain pipes, and I chop them off about four inches, and I just push them in the ground about two inches. Then I sow my seeds in there. That's ideal for when they've come up and you're weeding with the owl. You, there's no risk of clouting the seeds and chopping it off. But you've got to remember, a couple of years, I forgot to take these off. The parsnips have grown that big. The, the wedge, the stuff, will deform the collar. You have to cut it off, it does. The parsnips will deform them. That's cruel, that is, mate. Sorry, no, it's, what's the F2S? Levington's compost. Oh, OK. Something. Mick, Mick, Mick do sell it now, because he's too dear, ain't Mick? I've put the price up a quid a bag, so I'll yeah. feed them off. And that, that's my, my parsnip seed sown in the inside the collar. There's five seeds in there, and I'll, so I'll just pick the strongest one. I just bought a bag of F2 this morning. I had to pay our allotment association £6.95. That's cheap. That's very cheap. Yeah. yeah. Um, Usually out of 10 quid some places. Yeah. Yeah. It is cheap. I, I thought that. Um, how much did you charge for your clover, Mick? 4 50 all right. But I think any any seed compost is good as long as you sieve it and it's fine. So there's the parsnips all germinated now and I'm just getting rid of the ones I don't want to do and as I just cut them off at ground level. The risk some people do is pull it out. You might damage the taproot of the one you want to keep, which yeah. will then will throw it out wire. So I always cut them off with a better or better scissors. What size are those collars, Nigel? Uh, them them are the three inch drain pipe, down pipe from like oh, yeah. water pipes, yeah. Yeah. And about them about uh, four inches thick. Wow. There's one of my parsnips, but it's got a bit of canker on it. I think that might be a tender and true I what it is. But, but it does break the taproot off, as you can see. But, you know, we, that'll be a good pot. What, what can you do about parsnip canker? Is there a is there a remedy or cure, or is it something we just have to put up with? Well, everybody I know, what well, the shell blocks, what well, grow them in raised beds, blood like big sandboxes, what well, are cored out. They don't seem to get it, so I think it's a sore bone disease, what, yeah. what you get through growing them in the ground. 
Yeah, I, I, I've got it on my ground, definitely. Some people use uh, white washing that on the, the what's it? Oh, I've got a bit of old net curtain that I can whiz on and off in no time at all, and it keeps the sh shades of greenhouse lovely. It does. Ready for the summer we're going to have? <laughs> huh? Uh, that's one of my compost bins. Inside, that's me. We worm bin inside the greenhouse. I've covered that mm -hmm. with thick felt just to keep it insulated during the winter, keep them warm. Mm. And that's me. That's uh, part of this. I had six ton of cow manure delivered, and that I'd started barrowing it. It's a two hundred yard journey back and down to my what's it? One barrow. Wow. And we get about ninety barrows out of there. So I reckon I'd be about, about six mile. <laughs> uh, that's when I was filling my beds up. I built my beds. When I first moved on to my plot, it, the bloke grew nothing but fruit and the, the beds had never been fed at all. So I ripped all them out and I bought these builder's planks and I just dug them out. I double dug everything and put a layer of, of cow manure in the bottom. And then I just topped them. This this one here, I've just finished the level of the bed. The only thing I regret not doing is doing what Mick does and is line the boards. Because these, as they am bare, they've lasted me about five and six years and they're starting to rot now. Yeah. But what I'm gradually doing, I'm replacing these boards. I've got a load of paving slabs and I'm turning them up on the side. So I'm building the beds out of paving slabs. and. Uh, they will actually rock then, so it'll see me out after That's a bit of crop of beetroot, then we're uh, Baltardy. I've, I've grew a few others, um, Golden Burpee. Um, do you, on your, on your beetroot, do you do, do multi sown? I do multi sown at the beginning of the season because I take them like little golf balls. But the second crop that I put in, I'll, gr I'll spice them out and I use them, we pickle them, slice them and pickle them. And, but uh, this year I'm only growing uh, uh, Baltardy. That there, celery, that's me crop from the year before. Then we'll lay them self blanching. That's a setup of one of my greenhouse, in my greenhouse, in the garden. This is my right now greenhouse. That's a, a Vitapod double propagator with some, some Blaster T5 lights on the top. In the grass tent. I've got. A, I've just bought another double vitapod for the other end of the greenhouse as well. You're lucky. I looked at, and uh, they said there was none available at the minute. If you did look at Christmas, Colin, they had a 10% discount off. Oh, as well. <laughs> don't tell him that. He'll put his bunny wrist. <laughs> <laughs> I see the old gardeners have had him, are they? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a uh, crop wow. of uh, the Masar Palmyra. I've took out the. The one bed that was the last bed I grow potatoes in the ground. Since then, I've grown everything in in containers, thirty litre containers. And then we'll Why would you do years. that? I hate digging potatoes up. <laughs> I actually I, I used this spare them, and I mean this this year was a fine example. Christmas Day, I went down to get the veg. The ground was rock solid, so I'm thinking if I was in digging potatoes up now, I'd be knackered. So I just got the bucket, get it a little squash, tipped it upside down. Apart from the top pinch, the soil was moist and loose, and I got a crop straight away. The, the only downside is keeping them watered, but I'm, I'm setting a water, well, not a semi-automatic watering system for the buckets this year. You don't bury you don't bury the uh, pot into the soil then. Yeah, what I do, I, I, the the beds that, when I'm going to put my pots on, I give them a top dress and a manure, probably about six inches deep. Then I scallop hole out, sink the pot in so it's sunk about nine inches. Then in between the pots I'll grow my sunflowers and the and the orphan awesome yeah. feeds the sunflowers as well. That there's these are my carrots. There's of uh, them are, these are tanks here, then what you are getting the uh, roof space in the loft from the old water uh, eat central heating system. These are them raised up about a foot, eighteen inches. And what I do with those, about every three years, I completely empty them, put about six inches of horse manure in the bottom, then put the soil back in, because I don't want the the nutri the goodness right at the top for the, to fork the carrot, so I'll leave it to make the roots go down. And uh, I do two or three different st staggered sounding, 
mindless sweet candle. Uh, that's a few cherry trees. Right behind me there you can see there's a cherry tree which I'm, it's in the way really. It's right where my compost bins and I've got three big compost bins. And they've been all in and all, in all in and all. And I was going to get an appointment with the chainsaw one of the days. Oh, and, and, oh. And I thought, no, I'll give it to, I'll give it to another, I'll do it next year. And lo and behold, the same year we had, that was like one of probably about four or five crops we had off that. No, that's, that's amazing. And we had, we had like, I mean, the, the oh. blackbirds and, and the magpies have a load of them. I have netted part of it, but it, I, oh, I, yeah. I cropped it down in the summer, and hopefully this year we'll get we'll still get a decent crop of it. Yeah, you can't chop that down, mate. It's beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Uh, there's some of my sunflowers I grew where I, I won the challenge this year with. Now I've done three out of four years. Uh, that's a little mate I got on our site. We've we've. we've <laughs> There's a tremendous amount of robins and them very, very territorial. You'll, you'll see them fighting. Oh. But in the garden, you, you'll put the food out on the table and, and you'll actually come on the table while you're there. They're oh. really, really friendly people, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's the last, that's how cold it's been on our allotment. Even the skeleton was complaining. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Cheers. Cheers, Nigel. Thank you. Right, uh, me mate, me give us a ring. You wanted some uh, membrane, weed membrane, so I cut him a slice off. This is what I use to top dress me raised beds once I have top dressed. I then give it a good watering and then cover it with a weed membrane to overwinter. Let nature do my digging. If you need any any of uh, Amazon, just put in a weed membrane. And then you've got all your different lengths, sizes, what people. You, obviously, it's cheaper to get the roll, but if you, if you ain't got an allotment or a big size garden, then uh, you don't need the roll. So it can just be by the meat. Yes. They've brewed up at Will Coles. Are they? 13.95 now. Yeah. You've got to shop around there, yeah. Amazon or eBay. But uh, once you've got it, it does last. But if you do I, cook I, it, then you've got to tape it because it'll be it'll fray it. I, I always find these sort of things, these sort of things, are, you're better off buying. I, I tend to buy buy them up in sort of October, November, December. Mm. Yeah. You know yeah. when you cut it, Mick? Yeah. And it frays? Yeah. Um, I found what I, what I started to do is run a soldering iron down the edge. Yeah. Or a flame just to... Or a or a lighter, yeah, and it seals it, and it's quite, quite good. Makes a bit of a stink. I do, I, I do that with me and Vida. Make sure I cut it as well. Stops it from. Oh, do that like all the week. Yeah, uh, I just use a black tape out of Wilco. Yeah, well, you, you've got more money than us. I did have. <laughs> I think he's sponsored by Wilco. <laughs> anyway, my runner beans, which I put in. They swell that much, I couldn't get them out of the bloody thimble. <laughs> Eventually, I did get them out. Obviously, one per pot. Give them a good watering. Warm into the greenhouse. Is that this year? You're a yeah. bit early for that, mate. What are you going to do? you going to go with it? They're going in the tunnel. All right. How long do you put them in water for, mate? Hey? How long do you put them in water for? Just overnight. Okay. Just overnight, huh? This is uh, one of my old ears. I get the papers for in the morning. It's got bracken on the front garden, which is dried fern. Mm. I said, I'll cut them back for you. <laughs> what we call get around here. Another natural product for my compost. Look at that beautiful stuff. Mm -mm. And there's my little mate again watching me preparing this lot for oh, you. Technical assistant. <laughs> right, what I should have done when I was down Wilco Monday was took a photo of their uh, runner bean cane or their eight foot canes. Well, I don't think they'd be eight foot, probably six foot. But they was pathetic. They were thin as a ferret on eat. But these here, I 
because I've got a good contact now for thick canes. And we've only had one bloke bring them back. You see them too thick. Yeah, right. He needs to get out more. Uh, we've got a chap down. He get him a ring. And he's come to the situation now. He's a good gardener. He has loads of stuff off us. He says, Mick, I can't do it. I can't drive anymore. My knees are knackered. Obviously, he should have had his knee done yonks ago. The COVID. And I says, well, let me know. Give me a shopping list and I'll bring it out to you. And, that, and that's what I did. Got so, a couple of them doing that for, still looking after them. Wood chip, contacts for them. It's, they've got a key each. So when they're in our area, they just open the silver up and drop off. Exactly the same with the rabbit muck man. He, he's got a key as well. Rosie. Somebody's told me to put more fault. He's a hound. Yeah. Yeah, Another new one, not a new one, but uh, we ain't had them for a year because of the lockdown distance crap. This is my goat herder, has also got chicken, meaning she's got to clear the chicken muck and it's been there for a year. So they started dropping this off. So I've got to put a sword up, tell people what it is, but it is beautiful stuff. Full of How long does that take to break down, Mick? Well, that was three year old. Bloody hell. Two year, if it's all right anyway. But obviously, the longer, the more worms you're going to get in it, if you keep it moist. Uh, within two days, the wood chip bloke had done another drop off in our area. So that's filled that lot up again. Another sunny day, open the lot up. Right, pot leaks and blanch leaves, they're coming out. Because there's no wind, I know they're going to get blown over. They're going to get get a good soaking outside, meaning they've got the drainage, they're going to run off. And nice and upright. These will be potted uh, on next week, then the leaves will cover that next week. Right, leaf mould, Les, this is for you. Yes, I for it last week, but we got that much stuff on last week, so we're going to let you through these. Leaves are still about, you can still get them. If you've got a leaf bin, that used to be my four foot square bin, lined with plastic, keep them more warmth and moisture. You've oh, got to wait yeah. for every leaf that goes in, otherwise it will stay crisp. And then I'll put a carpet lid on top. As it breaks down, the carpet drops down with it. If you haven't got a, a pen, then you can use it in a strong bin liners. Fill the bin liner with leaves. You don't need activator, but if you've got a compost activator put a sprinkling on and then give it a good soaking a couple of holes in the bottom and then squash all the air out as the bin is on the on the left hand side there that's how i used to stack them uh them black bins there <coughs> going out to room down the plot so i was going to bring them all home and put them at the back of the shed top of the garden where it's too dark to do anything spare space and i have to put them there and after six months, that's what it's looked like. <coughs> you either use that as a top wow. dressing, but I just use my leaf mold as a compost ingredient. Or you can use these bins. This is what I use now. Six bins, mm. four for compost, two for leaf mold. This is spring, because me uh, black cotter bush in the middle just coming into leaf. Now the carpets are just coming off. As you can see on on the left, still got the carpets on, so winter mm -hmm. down White washed, ready for the summer. Uh, I have in in before now in one of these bins, a uh, four forty liter plastic black warm bin. I've had one and a half ton bags. On I know they compact and get compressed and everything. Well, I've put one and a half ton bags of leaves in one bin. That's how much they get them compressed. Oh. But they've been shredded. But everything, I put a, a two inch layer in and then give it a good soaking. Don't forget with these bins, it's like a raised bed. You can't over water because you've got the drainage. Once I put them in, I then squash them down. I push them down. I then water it again until it's pretty solid. And then I put my carpet lid on as well. Although it's got a, a, a lid on, the compost itself, the bin, as it breaks down like the compost bin outside, because that carpet was on top of it, the carpet stays and it keeps that surface moist. Mm. If you've got this carpet on the top of here, I'd have that cold void from the lid to the
to the surface of, of the <laughs> leaves and there's never any activity. You still get worms in leaf mold, but not so many as compost. But now I'll keep carpet on top of it. And I'll lift that carpet. It keeps it moist and you can see the activity there. Mm -hmm. Don't you ever stir it up, mate? No. Just worms leave it. It's, it's like the like the compost bins. How often do you turn it? I don't turn it. Worms turn it. If you look after the worms, don't forget worms going through it. That's that's how oxygen gets to around to the roots in the soil. Worms are legging it down. Yeah. They're little burrows when it rains. The rain legs it down the burrows what worms are in. So basically the worms are turning for you. What they're making oh. burrows. So every time I put something in my compost heap or my leaf mold bin, filling it up and then water, then there's there's your moisture. Thank you. That's what it's like after, that, that's probably about eight months. But I can rub that out by hand and it breaks up even smaller still. That's if I want to mix that with my own uh, growing medium. Mm. <laughs> Don't my looking crap on me as well. <laughs> right, this is from my mate. Where am I? I've got a, a mate who's a, a follower as well. He's in Indiana. USA, and this is Brent, and uh, he dumbfounded mm. his neighbour when he went round and asked him if he could collect up his molehills for him. He thought <laughs> he was good he Oh yeah, he ain't. he's a gardener and he's learning. Best topsoil you can get. <clears throat> right, we're going to have a break now. Not a break, but I'm going to do the draw. Right. Bear with me. <clears throat> yes. Right, have you all got your lucky uh, lucky charms with you? This is good, this is. Kath Holmes, are you with us? Yes. <laughs> are you here, Kath? Anyway, you will come first. We yeah. run. Pick you off so you don't win again. This is for the second prize. Good backwards. Andy, you'll come bloody close to us. <laughs> Nigel. Scott. Oh, bloody hell. Scott, you were bloody close then, boy. Catherine Williams. How'd you get on there, Mick? I don't think I was on it. I don't. Your name's on calling us, isn't it? Oh, is it? Oh. I'll put them on before. Catherine, are you here? Yes, I'm here, Mick. Boston. Yeah, You're thank after... you. I've got to ask the, the other one. No problem. What it wants first. And then, yeah, uh, no problem. You thank you. Whatever. If Thanks you can private much. message me your uh, address. Will do, thank you. Or email. Love late cheers. Thank you. Right, let's get rid of that. Right back on that one. Good, that worked. So that's some of what I can do without me me eldest. <laughs> right, bamboo canes. They're not bamboo canes, sorry, green split canes. I've got different <laughs> sizes. If you remember me wires I do. Mm -hmm. Nine inch and a foot in length. Mick. So, yes. Do you find. I, I don't understand. I, well, I do understand why they paint them green because it's for gardening and selling. But if you store. I, I, I found with these canes, if you store them indoors, you tend to get mowed on them. Uh, I've never had it in the shed, but having said that, I've got ventilation. Yeah, I think that's the problem then. Yeah. yeah. I've always <laughs> got the window open in the shed. Yeah, I think that's a problem. I think I think no, they. In my um... shed, I don't get it. No. Yeah. Mick, what do you clean them with? Clean what? The the sticks when you finish with them. Do you clean them before storing them? All I do is dry them out and then go over with a broom, meaning all I'm getting off them is the composters being left on them. 
but I don't sterilise or nothing yeah. like that. It makes me question what they actually spray these canes with. Well, that, that green stuff is supposed to be a protection to look after the timber and the mm. whatever. But uh, I think these um, might have it on a tape measure. I bet this one will go. Uh, I think the first lot were the yeah, number yeah, bolt yeah. for our trading sheds. But there's one cane per plant with the onion clip, which I'll call them, which you can see around the top of there. That's my pot leak, nice white roots on them, thick roots. That's why it's going to be potted on next week. There's my bracken drying it out, just in case there's still a bit of moisture on when I've got it up. I had to take this photo because this is the a photo of the, um, the muck we've had delivered. First all, a chicken muck. But just look at the um, registration on that car. <laughs> Next to my muck, I thought I love it. <laughs> I love that registration. I don't know what the car it was. And then two days last, uh, uh, later, my mate says, my mate has got to get rid of his off smug. He's bringing that round as well. So, God, Bennett, this is our, uh, this has been a, a good week for us, muck-wise. Mm -hmm. So I met him down there, and uh, I got a spare key for the plot, so I've given him a key as well. Obviously, to stop me coming down every time he rings up. <laughs> Obviously, I... Um, He's a good lad, otherwise I wouldn't give him a key. And what happened uh, a couple of days after, we had another delivery of chicken muck. Obviously, this was fresh, because as you see, it's still in the bags. So people, if they moan now about that car getting no muck, then there's something wrong with them. Right, this is from last week. This was when I got my um, spent coffee grounds from Tesco off the wenches. Scott told me about this. A couple of holes in the bottom. Took him down the plot, then I give the bag a, a watering, get it all moist, and then I'll uh, put that to one side and we'll come back and see how that looks. Avocado, I, I'm big and started doing this. It's going to be all, over a month now he's been doing this. But the roots, obviously, the tap root has gone bloody haywire. Then you've got side roots coming off it. He's even thrown uh, leaves on the top. But he's doing it as it tells you to do. Mick, is the out in water? Yes. That's just uh, rain water. Okay. But that is a close up of the roots. And you see the little modules coming out of the, the, the leaf, the root axles itself. It's fascinating. I've tried to zoom in closer, but my camera's crap on the phone. I might get a uh, big interview. Right, if you remember earlier on. Um, <coughs> That avocado, where would you plant it? In the ground or in a pot? Um, eventually, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the greenhouse and until I find out where it get better. Oh. <laughs> Obviously, it's got to be looked after over winter, isn't it? Yeah. So, I should say exactly the same as these, Bougainvillea, in a pot, and then I put them out uh, during the summer. And then the winter again, I just take the pot up and bring them indoors. That got warm in there, Mick. So they probably do exactly the same with the avocado. We failed to remember with these earlier on. Uh, so it's been less than, uh, well, probably about four days. I, I give the, these two here a bit of fresh compost under them. And if we zoom in on that one and that, I've got growth straight away. So obviously I've watered one up with a fresh compost. Trust he's had a bit of mycorrhizae under his iris. So that's working. So I've chuffed with that. Right, <coughs> first time I've ever had an onion go haywire, stored onion in the garage. Mm. Uh, so he was going to saft. If you don't get him out, he's going to turn the rest on the saft. It's just like if you get a, a bad tater in the saft <coughs> and the rest of them. So every week I just go through the lot and check the onions anyway. But uh, this is where my um, gladioli is stored in the garage. In those trays, exactly the same as what uh, I just said, the mushroom trays, crates. Right, I know it's a bit small, but uh, if anybody's interested, you can uh, get it on YouTube and blow it up tomorrow or later on. Anybody needs the maturing times for a few veg, 
this is okay. if you're entering the show or you want to find out if you start off early enough how many showings you get in one year but uh, there's, there's quite a bit there covered but you can always catch it up later on and copy it but I thought that might have been of interest Right, my talks over the year, I usually do one a week, or if it's during the summer, two a week, whatever. But luckily I've got more Zooms now coming in. There's, there's, there's quite a few uh, gardening clubs doing the Zooms. This is during the week and the weekends. Tatton Park, I should have been uh, Sunday, doing a talk there, and they've got a Zoom, so that's working well. And once again, that they've emailed me, says, we'll pay you 80 quid. I said it's only 50. I charge 80 because it's fuel to get there as well. As I'm not travelling nothing, my talks cost 50 quid, so that's all you're paying. Because I'm a good egg. Muck, that's the other muck. Bag muck we had in. So this lot, I mean, when this was delivered off, that, that's been two days. The the one on the right, which is a three year old chicken muck, that was a bit wet. Now, just in one day, it started drying out. And, and the, the worms inside of ANC is beautiful. Boston stuff and the other stuff and all. This was the trading sheds uh, yesterday. Obviously, social distancing. Busy. Oh, I think it was busy for an hour, first hour, which is good. And uh, glad to see Gavin and Paula again. They come down and give us a visit. Yeah, they went back with a load of stuff. Good lad. Right, one of our speakers for next week, <coughs> Jennifer Brody from Reeming. I've talked her into giving us a, or, or slot, educating, will uh, educate me as well. But uh, I've done quite a few, BBC Gardeners World, we, we've had um, a stand each day, and we've always had a good natter to each other. Edible Garden Show, when that used to be at Stonely, we used to, we met up there as well, and that's where we, we both got the, School kids did them a uh, try to get them involved in garden, but we had no help again. I also get robbed us myself by the ton for our trading sheds, that's how good it is. So, uh, that's something to look forward to next week. Mick, how, how would you apply the uh, rock dust? Rock dust, I use that as a top dressing on my raised beds when I'm prepared. Do you water in? I use it as a compost ingredient. A double and Same as everything else. Right, these are the carrots, uh, leeks and spuds. These was grown in the cold greenhouse. If you remember, I, I did some in the warm greenhouse and in the cold just to try it. To try it. Yeah, it's going off. Now, these uh, carrots were sown 30th of the 12th. That means it took two months to get to the state they are now. So we've had a, a couple of good frosts outside, I mean minus four fives. So these have done well. It's just proving you can still do it in a cold greenhouse basically. And they're the leaks, they've took a, a month. I'm just coming through now. Just about make them out. See in there? Little chaps coming through. So cold greenhouse, they've took a month. And um, my spud ease took two months. This was in a cold greenhouse as well. And that's it, guys and gals. No, it's not. I've got to. Oh, yes, it is. Hey. <laughs> what, what, what else you got lined up for next week, mate? Hang on. Speaking of voice vouchers. The only reason is I was going to ask Nick, Nick Brake, if you're still there. You're still there, Nick? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here, yeah. Would you have, if you've mixed got space, would you have time to do a little session on how to do uh, seed onion, saving seed? Yeah, 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 I can do that, yeah. I'd be interested in that, if there's a slot available, me. Yeah, yeah I, I've got a few, um, I've got a few photos I can show you. Um, actually, I'm really chuffed because I managed to save the biggest bow from last year. I've just seen it um, shooting two weeks ago. All right. Nick, I got a pay you, have I? <laughs> uh, well, I won't. I won't charge you for the fuel. Just keep it. Just keep a straight face, you talk. I won't charge you for the travelling, Nick. Enjoy, <laughs> right? Uh, 
somebody else who I've got a speaker lined up, but I can't get him till a, a week. So it'll be uh, Sunday the 14th. I've got Jerry Edwards. Yep. He's the top man on his fruit. Got a screen um, over door. A few years ago, Jerry put a fruit seminar Ooh. on at Wisley. Oh, went down for it. That was a good day out. Plus, we had a, a, a purr around the grounds. But I've got a, I've got him jobbing us on fruit. So I'm getting all my old contacts, different subjects. Uh, if there's anybody on dahlias, I know Jay. I got a few contacts, but I'm, I'm busy. That poor do it on a. So if anybody's doing dahlias, croissants, anything like that, just what we got to do, supposed to do now, pair, pairing ground, anything like this. Only need a, I don't know, eight to ten photos and, and a rifle, just on each photo, just a little spiel. If you don't fancy talking yourself, there's a few that don't, then just send me the photo ups and the, the write up. Not too big a write up because I've got bloody write it down and copy it right down again. But I'll, I'll do the spiel if you want to do it. So if anybody's interested, they want to do us a bit. Anybody got any questions while we got you all here? Yeah. Are you ready? Yes, go. Um, how do you get rid of ground elder? Yes, ground elder. What have you tried? Have you tried Nothing the cannon? Yet. <laughs> Nothing yet. Glass of fate while you can still get it then. It's absolutely destroying part of the garden. Hmm. Uh, anything with glyphosate in? I, I'd try. I'd give that um, roseate uh, gallop a try. Yeah, that, that, that kills mouse things. I got some of that gallop this week, um, Nigel. Yeah. Can you get uh, that yeah. easy enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought A it off um, Amazon. You can get. Yeah, it. Amazon. I think it was twenty-two pounds for two liters. Or you can get it off <laughs> eBay and all probably. Oh, you obviously, obviously that's, that's a concentrate. Three. You won't see nothing for about three or four weeks, but all of a sudden they just collapse. Yeah, well, I'm going to spray it. Sorry, sorry, I'm going off subject here because um, I've tried also. It's like Mars Tail. I've yeah. got Mars Tail as well, but um, Mars Tail. Oh, young posh, are Mars Tail. Really Mars Tail. Mars Tail. Yeah. That gallop you spray it on. Yes. The problem I've got is underneath that roots is a pear and a plum tree that's very old. Because it, it's a, it's it's an inert. Uh, weed killer. As soon as it touches the soil, it becomes inert. It will only kill green stuff. So unless you're spreading it on the leaves, it will all kill it. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah. The other thing to do and all, because I'm a bit waxy, what I do, I put a tiny drop of fairy liquid in and all. It makes it stick to the plant better, especially with mare's tail. Okay, mate. Thanks very much. Nigel. Yeah. Uh, that gallop I bought, I bought two litres. I've tried all sorts. I've got some um, other toxic stuff, but, but I'm reluctant to use. Mm. Um, that gallop, you just... I've read the instructions, but I think I got it right. Just spray it on the plants and leave yes. it, and seven days, you're fine. I, I, I found... I think the ratio I mix was 40 to 1. I use a little syringe, I do, too. Yeah. And do it like that. Put the water in the container before you put the... The, so the weed killer in. If you put the weed killer in first, it farms up. Yeah, yeah. So put your water in, then give it a shake. Say so I put a drop, just a drop of, of washing up liquid in to make it stick to the leaves. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And on that gallop, should, yeah. I should, I should, I haven't read the, I haven't read the um, uh, well, data sheet yet, yeah. but I will. So basic, basically, you can still grow after about seven days with it, can't you? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the leaflet I've got, it says it's inert as soon as it touches the soil. Yeah. Um, mm. That's a good thing, then, Art. Thank you, Rick. Oh, yeah, Glenn, Glenn's showing off his... Um, uh, what's this, Glenn? That's an onion. Oh, thank you. <laughs> From seed or set? From a set. Wilco. Hashtag Wilco. <laughs> it could be a world record. <laughs> I, no, 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 no. 
Are you trying to tell us you missed one, Mick? Aye. Are you trying to say you missed one? No. Have you got a wire around that onion? No. Has that onion been given any light? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's from a set. Ah, set, yeah. Mick? Yes. Can I ask about my compost bin? Why are the worms all collecting up near the lid? What's wrong with the compost? Why are they escaping? Did you message me? Yes, I did. The other day I write it down. As soon as you said it then, I thought, crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my memory's dry. Not my question, I hope. <laughs> I, I've had them myself once. Huh? And the problem was, because the inside the rim is nice and moist, Worms like it nice and moist, so they hang around there. And that's why I thought they were there. But they was trying to get out because they was all around there. Because when I went in the compost heap, there was none whatsoever. They was all yeah. in the rim. And mm -hmm. I took the lid off and, and the a bloody great dollop of them fell on the floor. It's too hot. So I, no, I had to put no. my brain into gear. No, no food or acid. Out, acid in there. Lemon. Citrus. Onions. Leeks, oranges, uh, not leeks. Lemons. Lemons, oranges, onions. Since I've kept them out, I've had no problem whatsoever. That's interesting. Um, then we'll break down in the compost heap, especially if it's a hot compost heap. But if it's got worm, you composting, you can compost using heat or worms. I want worms because they do my digging. Ideally, in a compost heap, they were a uh, hot bin. They will, they will break down there. They would break down in a worm bin, but not yeah. by the worms. But if you put too much in, and I, I was, well, I weren't putting too much in, but I was getting, because I weren't getting enough compost myself, i.e. from the household, um, kitchen waste. I, I was getting the kitchen waste off the staff where I had my mum and my aunt in the old folks home. I bribed them with a couple of bottles of wine and they saved me all their kitchen scraps. But because they was feeding the old ones, the oranges, lemons, for the vitamins and, and all this crap. There was loads of it in the bloody, and that, that's that's how I got it. I was putting too much citrus in, and the worms they like it. Since I've kept them out, I've had no trouble whatsoever. Mick, um, what about rat rats? Liz, did that answer you? Yeah, um, it does. I perhaps get my pH meter into my compost heap eh? and mm. see if that works. The other thing, Mick, I found with my worms try to escape if they've run out of food as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm adding. Uh, usually, if, if, if there's no food, then they'll, they'll leg it out the bottom. Mm. What, what's your um, theory on rats, Mick? If, if you've got rats or vermin, uh, anything like that is too dry. Too dry because they can make runs? Yep. Nick, my my worm bins and wheelie bins, refuge council refuge bins. Yep. And what I did with mine, I drilled twelve mil holes in the bottom for drainage with a tank underneath. Oh. And I put a row of rip holes round just under the rim to keep it dry, but it let air flow. And during the winter, I had my carpet around the bin to insulate them. Yeah. A rat, a rat got up the inside of the carpet. And actually bit a hole through the wheelie bin. Bloody Nora. <laughs> oh. I, had to, I had to glue a steel plate on the inside. That's an SAS rat, that is. <laughs> I've had the same, mate. It's a I had two rats in composter and they just end the way through. Yeah. Bloody Nora. Nah. It's funny, I was watching, it um, doesn't matter who it was, I was watching a video on YouTube um, yesterday. The six best things to keep rats away. I haven't got rats in my compost bins, um, but um, it, it's very true what they say. Uh, I know fish and yeah. meat keep meat. Keep, yeah. keep keep that away. But yeah. if you're chucking in scraps like tomatoes, I checked a load of old parsnips that had um, gone centered, you know, gone hard yeah. in the compost bin. It made me think about it. Um, just basically um if, you, if you're not going to keep it wet they, they, i've got three compost bins you know 